so the first thing I want to say is thank you for having me back. And those of you who are members, especially if you've been here a long time, should just know that it is rare and valuable to have a sustainable writing community. It's, writing is a solitary act. It's a solitary profession. It can feel like a really solitary life. And to have some people to share the experience with, to share some work with, to just get a chance to come out and be a writer for a morning and actually feel like you're out amongst people who share the passion, that is one of the things that can really keep you writing. So I am, this is valuable. And the fact that there are so many of you here, that you're doing this on a Saturday morning, that you're coming out to see me, that's a really rare thing. So well done to you. Um, it's a funny thing to say. I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was two. Um, my parents have a 90-minute cassette tape to prove it, which they drag out every now and then when they feel like I'm getting too proud of myself. Um, it is, the tape is of me following my relatives, my aunts and uncles are there, my grandparents are there, following them around the house, telling them stories. I was a very sophisticated storyteller at that time. The storyteller, the villain, was my just-born brother, Eric. <laughs> and the stories all involved Eric wreaking havoc and me saving the day. And I had developed, I had no idea I was going to ever write horror as part of what I do, but I had developed a, a really sophisticated, intuitive suspense technique. Every other sentence was, did you know what happened? <laughs> and with the funniest thing about the tape, um, to me, is that for the first 40 minutes of the tape, all the adults are so good-natured, so indulgent, they're clearly enjoying me. And then one by one, voices disappear from the tape as people leave the room. And then for the last 20 minutes of the tape, there's a lot of walking going on, meaning my father, my endlessly cheerful father, is trying to get away from me. And so he's the last one left. He's the one who won't actually tell me to stop, but he's trying to get out of my orbit. And I just keep following behind him and saying things like, and then Eric brought a whale. You know what happened? My dad stays cheerful for 88 minutes. And then the tape ends with, did you know what happened? What? What? What happened? And the tape slides off. All of that is just to say that for someone who knew that I wanted to write when I was born, I think maybe the greatest gift that the writing life has given me is endless surprise. It certainly isn't money. Um, but there is, both in terms of what the world responds to, when one is at actually able to make an impression on other people when one isn't, but also in terms of what my writing life was going to be, what I was going to turn out to write, where I was going to have opportunities, would so this path that I've been on even in the nine years since I've talked to you last, every day it's something new that I wouldn't have called. Um, I am probably best known as a, a ghost story writer, as a horror writer complete accident. Um, I was, I had started teaching. I was, um, I'd always wanted to be a fiction writer. I had written a novel, also an accident, um, involving where I grew up in Detroit and some horrible things that happened in a winter there and I wasn't writing about the horrible things. I was writing about what it was like to be 11 as in Detroit, which was falling apart and what it felt like to be a kid in the midst of all of that. And I was trying to sell that and get to getting a lot of letters that I became very familiar with in my life, which were things like, you know, this is, I think it's really good. What is it? <laughs> um, and my, um, my brother, not really a villain, it turns out, he waggishly said at one point about that book, it's like To Kill a Mockingbird meets Silence of the Lambs, which in some ways is as close as anybody's come to defining my default mode, probably. Um, but I was trying to sell that and getting a lot of, it's good, what is it? And meanwhile, I had stumbled into teaching, also an accident, found that I loved it. Um, and the, I wasn't teaching creative writing yet, except 
I loved Halloween, I loved telling ghost stories, and so for a few years I had been telling my students ghost stories. And this became a thing on campus. I was teaching high school at the time, and by the fourth or fifth year, I was turning out the lights, wearing a robe, bringing a little flashlight and holding it under my chin. You know, you need all the aid you can get to scare 15-year-olds. And um, so this fourth or fifth year, I had all the lights out of my room. And I was in the back, sort of hiding under my robe. It's really going to scare these kids. And somehow didn't notice that my classroom was much more populated than it usually is. Um, told my story, got a lot of applause from the kids, and then the phone rang in my office, and I was called to the principal's office along with all of the AP chemistry students who had ditched class to come hear my story. <laughs> so the principal bawled them out, then called me in, looked at me and said, really? You didn't notice that they're kids, you have no idea who they are in your room? I said it was dark, which really didn't help my cause much. <laughs> I came out, and one of the kids I didn't know said to me, you know, Hirschberg, you might want to write that one down. And I thought, really? I don't write ghost stories. I read them. I've always liked them. I don't write ghost stories. Went home, wrote it down. It came out 68 pages long. If you know anything about publishing, there is no worst length. I pretty much hit it within two pages, give or take, of the worst possible length. There is no magazine on earth that publishes 68 page stories, and it's not a novel. <laughs> I couldn't think of what to do with it. So I had been writing reviews to just for the reassuring sensation of occasionally seeing my name in print. And there was a Canadian, little Canadian group, a ghost story society. I knew they um, I, I'd written reviews to them. So I wrote, emailed them, and said, hey, um, I wrote this thing. I don't know what to do with it. I'd just like some feedback. I didn't have a High Desert Writers Club to bring it to. Um, could, I, could I send it to you? And they said, oh, sure, whatever. So I sent it. I will never, you will never have an easier sale in your life. I sent it. 45 minutes later, I got an email from them that said, we'll take it. I didn't even know what for. <laughs> they didn't have a magazine as far as I knew, not that published fiction. A few months later, this little Canadian hardback came out. I think there were 600 copies. I don't know how anybody saw it. But eight weeks later, I was up for a World Fantasy Award, and I'm sitting in a room with, here's Ramsey Campbell, this famous British horror writer on one side, Dennis Etchison, who just died, a uh, famous American horror writer on the other side. Here's Stephen King over here. And I'm competing against them for the World Fantasy Award. And all of a sudden, my inbox is full of invitations to write ghost stories, which I thought I didn't write. And I looked at the invitations and realized, hmm, I think I do. And I started writing them. So, um, and by the way, having sold those ghost stories, as soon as that happened, one of the editors who had my book, not really a ghost story, really a straight up literary novel for all its dark overtones, it was a book called The Snowman's Children, editor in New York, one of the people who'd said, I like it, what is it? And who'd been sitting on it for nine months, called me one day and said, okay, I'll buy it. <laughs> then she bought the book of ghost stories, but not before she called me, story of my life, as you'll see, and said, okay, you gotta help me. I think I like these a lot. I'm a lot more sad than scared. And this is a weird phone call. I hope, you, I hope you never have this experience because as I was sitting there on the phone, I was thinking, the next words out of my mouth are going to sell this book or not. And I really, I hadn't planned anything. I didn't know what to say. I just wrote the stories. Um, and what I said was, um, well, they're people and they're ghost stories. And I started to explain that, and she said, okay, and hung up. No idea. She bought it that afternoon. Um, so having hit a groove where clearly maybe there was some room there, I went and wrote a Federal Writers Project novel about the Great Depression. Um, more ghost stories, whatever. So um, got kind of well-known in Russia. 
much better known than here. But it's another good gift. I like, surprised I got to go on a little book tour in Russia. That was a crazy experience. Um, doing lots of teaching, I got to build a writing program from scratch, which eventually led me to Cal State San Bernardino, where I helped, where I helped launch that program, and then went back to keep building the program for adolescents that has really become my teaching life's work, um, in which I love. But in the midst of that, I got an, an email one day from uh, an editor named Ellen Datlow, who's kind of a big cheese in the horror field, not someone you turned down. And she said, wrote me and said, I'm doing a vampire anthology, do you have anything? And I was snotty and considerably younger than I am, and looked at this email. I, I, hopefully I've never taken myself all that seriously. I take the work really seriously. And I do not differentiate between my Federal Writers Project, Great Depression novels, and my ghost stories. Whatever I'm writing, I apply the same standards, and I obsess in the same crazy way. And I looked at this email, and wrote back to Ellen Datlow, to the astonishment and horror of my wife and friends, I don't do vampire stories. <laughs> a week later, I woke up, this is the only time this has ever happened to me, with the first line of a vampire story in my head. Wrote her back, you'll see, I get my comeuppance here. Wrote her back and said, um, it turns out I do write vampire stories. She writes back and says, well, great, Hope you find somewhere for it. We didn't get funded for the anthology, so good luck. <laughs> so I wrote it, um, sold it, and um, went on with my life. Two years later, apropos of nothing, it, that story had what I was convinced was the best ending I would ever come up with for anything. I was really proud of it. <laughs> Two years later, Apropos of nothing, I realized I knew what happened five minutes after the ending and what had happened five minutes before the story started. And faster than I have ever written anything, I wrote a vampire novel. So, sold that, small press. Then, um, when we do Q&A, there's a lot I could talk to you about and I'm happy to talk to you about. I would like this to be useful to you. I actually don't like talking about myself like this, but let you let me know what you want to hear more about. My publishing journey has been as bizarre and unpredictable as my writing life in a lot of ways. I was, had published that book, Small Press. I had just left my agent of 15 years. Um, complicated person, complicated relationship, but ultimately what it boiled down to is she didn't know what to do with me either. Um, and so she wasn't doing me any good. So by this point, I had something of a reputation as a passably good writer, especially in horror. So I called one of the editors I knew in New York at um, Major Press and said, so I have this vampire novel, it just came out small press, it got these really good write-ups, do you want to look at it for a Major Press book? He said, sure, I'll look at it. Hour later, <laughs> he calls and says, okay, we'll buy it, but we want three. Can you guess what I did next? No, before that, yes, but there's a step before that. You, you, you haven't, you let, look, that's correct. I wrote him back immediately and said, I don't write vampire trilogies. <laughs> and then it turns out I do. Um, which was really interesting. I spent five years doing that. Wrote these books that I never meant to write, that I'm proud of, I think came out well couldn't look for an agent in that time because I had nothing to give them that they could make money on. I'd already sold the books for the five years. So it was a good and a terrible thing that I did. Um, I only a few months ago picked up a new agent for writing something so unbelievably different. It, it's called All Happy People. And if there's irony in the title, it's that it's, there's no irony in the title. Um, but anyway, that's how writing seems to work. And if there's a message I have to you, for you about inspiration is that, at least for me, learning how to be a writer, learning how to stay writing forever, means just staying awake. 
staying alert and being open to what the story <coughs> wants to be. I have written so many different things. I have been caught so much off guard. I never know when it's gonna happen. The most recent thing I've written, which I'll maybe share a little bit with you at the end if you're interested, came out of my daughter. We get a rare book catalog and my daughter and I always turn immediately to the cozies section when it comes to laugh at the titles. I don't know if any of you read cozies, but some of them are very clever. Um, you know, knitting ones, arsenic and old lace. Um, you know, lots of sort of playful, cozy, punny titles. But a lot of them aren't even trying. They will just, okay, it's a cozy, it's a bakery, and there's gotta be a murder. So there's a whole series. Um, Christmas pudding murder. <laughs> Chocolate cake murder. <laughs> Boston cream pie murder. Blueberry muffin murder. There you go. I guarantee you that's been used. I'm afraid you can't have that. So um, maybe some of you have read it. Maybe they're terrific, but the titles just really, my daughter especially, it just makes her laugh like very few things do. She's 16. Great, sullen, tough, but those, oh, th there's my delighted daughter again as soon as that catalog comes. So I wrote a story about titling cozies. I don't know where I didn't expect to get a story out of that. I wasn't reading the catalog for that. But I tell my students all the time, where do you get a story? Where do ideas come from? Well, let's say you go home from school and they're your parents. And let's say you're in one of those rare moods where you actually feel like talking to them. And you're going to answer their questions. And you sit down to dinner, and they say to you, well, how's your day? And you say, mm, it's fine. And then they say, well, what's new? What happened? What's the thing you tell? And the answer is, the thing that was different. So story really is routine, breaking routine. It's that simple. There is no other trick, and there's no elevating necessary. If you notice that someone is reacting to something differently than you expect them to, having a different emotional response to an event, that's a story. If you notice yourself responding differently to something, that's a story. That's where the tales are. It doesn't have to be anything involving vampires. <laughs> that said, since I did that, and since this just came out, I thought I'd share a little bit of it with you so you get a feel for what I do. Um, and one thing I will say, honor whatever the genre is that you're writing in. And by the way, I wouldn't obey the, anyone telling you, oh, you're a mystery writer. Whatever that means, just write your stories. If you're writing a mystery, if there's a murder in it, you should probably try and solve it. People are gonna be interested. <laughs> Um, if you're going to write a vampire story, I very quickly realized, if I'm going to do that, I want to do that. I don't want my vampires to sparkle. Um, they're not nice. These are things you don't want to meet. That said, I also, I'm always interested in relationships, in people, in characters. That doesn't change when I'm writing a vampire story. And so one of the things I started thinking about that really drove the whole thing was, well, let's say you are one of these things, and let's say there's any trace of humanity left in you. Seems to me one of the hardest things about being a vampire is how do you choose? Meaning, how do you decide who you're going to eat? <laughs> how do you do that? So some of the books are about that. The characters get very complicated in the book. The vampires hopefully get, hopefully get really interesting without being nice. Um, and the human characters, their very human struggles, the whole, the, it's, the trilogy wound up being called the Motherless Children Chil uh, Trilogy. And really, it's a whole story about motherhood and parenting. Um, and it's all one story. So with my usual you know, wisdom in choosing and sense of surprise and adventure, I decided I'd read to you from the third book of the trilogy. So obviously, you're coming in in the middle. Um, and I wanted to read you the chapters, some of the chapters are from the human character's point of view, some from the vampires. This is a vampire, this is the worst of the vampires. Um, this is the person who started this particular vampire group. Her name is Aunt Sally. Um, 
And all you really need to know is that she's very bad. She's big trouble. You never want to meet her. Um, and in the second book, I'll spoil as little as possible just in case you actually like this and want to read it, which I hope you do. Um, she's had this group. She spent all her many lives in Mississippi, in the Delta, with some of the creatures she has made around her. Near the end of the second book, a, this sort of strangely charismatic, wispy orphan girl winds up in their camp. And without giving too much away, this inspires Aunt Sally to maybe get out and see the world. So she does some especially horrible things to her creatures, um, and then lights out with this girl into the country, where she quickly finds herself adrift. So that is where we find her right now. They're in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, it's five years after the second book ends. And I'll just read you a little section of this. The book has many moods. It is, hopefully, it is often sad, um, playful, spooky, I think, um, and a vampire story, meaning if you're going to tell that story, which is about decay, death, attraction, corruption, all that kind of stuff, it can be a little... I am known as a writer, but a lot of my... The fans that I do have were surprised by these books, pleasantly in the end, but I think it was a jolt that I, there is blood in these books. It's a vampire story? I don't know how you do that. I, I wouldn't do that without acknowledging that this is in some fundamental way about the body. So, I'll share with you a little bit of that, and then we'll see where we go. In the sidewalk shadows, just outside the cone of light from the juddering lamppost overhead, which leaned like the trunk of some cliffside tree in the torrent of air, Aunt Sally watched. Paper pumpkins and pillowcase ghosts danced and dangled in ribbon nooses from awnings and overhangs. The wood and red brick buildings whistled, stood their ground but did so loudly, expelling sounds as the wind worked into cracks in century-old mortar, through warped window panes and slowly bucking door frames. Newspapers tumbled by, and a hat. Even the press on Halloween decals on the windows of the coffee shop, mostly leering black and white skeleton cattle and pirate scarves, seemed to bubble in place, shiver with the glass. Inside the coffee shop, on the other side of the glass, Zhu struggled among the natives. That's the girl she is caring for, if that's the right word. On every shabby couch, at each stained and grooved wooden table, the denizen swiveled to watch, flinching when she unleashed that smile of hers each hair on their faux cowboy beard straining toward her like long grass with a wind in them. It was the same each night. Each time Zhu convinced Aunt Sally to stop. Zhu preferred college towns, which amused Aunt Sally and also confused her a little. Zhu was only 14, and due to her circumstances, both before and after uh, the great unmaking, this is an event at the end of book two, she wasn't the most likely university candidate. Yet she always seemed so poised in these places, downright comfortable, instead of careful cagey like she usually was. Always she gravitated to the local all-ages music hangouts, where beardy boys and the inexplicable girls and less beardy boys who groomed and petted those beards clustered around sludgy espressos and whisper-sang miserable tunes about miseries Aunt Sally supposed they imagined they felt. Sometimes they'd sing old ballads or blues they'd inhaled somewhere. Those typically made Aunt Sally laugh, which was why Zhu wouldn't let her come inside anymore, made her go off to find her own amusements, or lurk on the streets with only the wind and whoever had the misfortune of happening across her path for company. Through the shuddering glass, she watched Zhu make her slow head down way to the microphone on the little bare rug near the order counter. Once on the little stage, she lifted her head high enough to speak into the mic. Aunt Sally couldn't hear, but she knew Zhu was using that rustling leaves murmur that the beardy boys read as shyness, but it wasn't shyness. Aunt Sally had spent mo the most pleasurable parts of the last five years figuring Zhu out. She had come to suspect that what the girl really signaled most nights was a reluctance to unleash. What Aunt Sally hadn't figured out was exactly what Zhu was holding back, a mystery, a bottomless glinting cave of a person to explore. Not even mother, Aunt Sally's partner vampire, gone now, uh, had brought such fascination to Aunt Sally's nights, such renewed reasons to bother to wake. Not even close. 
Out here, far from the delta in this windy world full of creatures whose nights ended in sleeps that melted into days they got up for. She supposed they, they called whatever Zhu radiated charisma or presence, maybe even talent. All Aunt Sally knew was that it was there, winking in the girl's deceptively placid green eyes and the lava curls of her hair where it escaped from her braids. Some nights, Aunt Sally could literally feel it rising off her like heat when she slept. Another gust roared down the street, pouring into Aunt Sally's nostrils but carrying no smells. At the microphone inside the coffee shop, Zhu was singing. When she sang, her eyes narrowed but stayed open so she could watch the effect she was having. She swayed just enough to set her lava hair swirling. When the door opened to admit another beardy boy, Aunt Sally heard her voice briefly, husky quiet. The context was completely wrong, so it took Aunt Sally a moment to recognize the tune. When she did, she shook her head. What a strange, marvelous girl she had chosen to make instead of unmake. Grace Holler, one of those ballads that had seemed to swell from the very earth in the delta, to float already whole on the sweet summer breeze streaming out of some half-imagined shadow past no one could quite remember. Of course, that song recounted a very real incident, or two incidents, really. The night Aunt Sally's monsters swept down on that tiny hamlet at the edge of the piney green woods and left it empty and silent as the lost Roanoke colony. From the trees, poor boys. From the trees, poor girls. They came and they went as if heaven sent. Heaven sent, Aunt Sally thought, half humming, missing the Delta, if not her monsters. She missed Mother, too, of course. Way down in the humming, grace holler emptiness of her heart, something stirred. Wakened, turning away from the window, she caught sight of her own reflection and stopped. Ju's song dropped away. So did the street. The wind, the line dance racket from the bars next door, and the more than occasional wolf whistles from passing man boys in their pickups. It all winked out, as though she'd switched them off, or her reflection had. Was that really her face? That sharp? That thin? With her fingers, she traced the edges of the cheekbones, twin points of a single blade, an Aunt Sally ice pick buried in there. How long had it been, she wondered. She reached out toward the window, but whether to cup her reflection or try to smear it away, she had no idea. Months, she realized. It had been months. A year? Was that even possible? In the beginning, the not eating, the eating less, had been a sort of game like the party she'd once thrown her monsters just to give their nights variety, give them all something to look forward to. It had provided structure, and better still, intensity to the endless traveling nights with Zhu. Also, it had been a challenge, the sort of sacrifice she'd been told mothers made for the good of their children. Aunt Sally had decided to make this one for Zhu, so Zhu never had to see or even know, until and unless Aunt Sally decided she should. But eating nothing? No one? Was that even possible? Shouldn't the hunger have come for her by now? Or rather, shouldn't it have overwhelmed her? Left her no choice? Because the truth was, it never left. It never had, not even in the old days. Not even right after she'd eaten. Certainly, it was with her now. It was practically screaming inside her. From the trees, poor boys. From the trees, poor Sally. The hand she'd raised trembled on its thin wrist like the last leaf on a dead branch. Aunt Sally cocked her head and watched it. Hunger, she hummed in an almost tune she was inventing on, inventing on the spot. Why have you forsaken me? The man appeared over her left shoulder, out of nowhere, as though she'd summoned him out of the glass. She mistook him at first for another beardy boy. He had the beard all right, and wore the same sort of heavy crabapple red checked overshirt. But he held his head too high, and his hands floated comfortably at his side, didn't fold over each other or disappear mournfully into pockets. Also, he stood too still, a beardy man then, beardy grown-up, assuming that's what beardy boys eventually did if they got the chance. Then it hit her, startled and even scared her. How is it possible for this guy to stand this close to her, barely five feet away, right over her shoulder, and stay that still? Even if all she could see was her reflection, and even if she barely noticed him, had her own along with her hunger? Just how much of herself had she traded away or cast off for Zhu's sake? They grow up so fast, said the man through his beard, and even before he'd finished, Aunt Sally started to laugh. She was relieved, she truly was. 
The issue wasn't whether she'd looked at him, wasn't her at all. The issue was that he hadn't looked at her yet, not all the way. She eyed his reflection in the glass. He was staring right through their reflected selves into the coffee shop toward whichever beardy boy was his. Aunt Sally saw him smile. I shouldn't be out here watching, I know. He'd kill me if he saw me. I just, I kind of love seeing him. I don't know, claim his world, you know? Does that make sense? Am I a terrible father? Laughter exploded out of her and shut him up. This was astounding, she thought. Amazing. Even better than mesmerizing or unmanning or God knew fucking them. It was better even than hunger. Or rather, this was a better kind of hunger. Tonight it had come to her heightened, seasoned with something brand new. The sensation of standing in the evening chill with another parent, caretaker, guardian, whatever, and keeping an eye on the kids together. Watching them do kid things, claim their world. Aunt Sally, scourge of the Delta, soccer mom. <laughs> the guy still hadn't noticed her yet, not consciously or properly, though the process had begun. Aunt Sally could see it in the slow swivel of his hips as the pull she exerted trickled into him through all the usual vulnerable places. He kept on chattering, though. Sometimes you almost forget there are other people going through the same stuff, you know? You get so locked up in your own shit or your kid's shit, which, let's face it, is pretty much your shit by this point, at least all the shit you have time for, right? So right, Aunt Sally said. She put a hand over her mouth, but laughter spilled out through her fingers. That made her laugh even harder. What, said the beardy man, starting to turn his head. Aunt Sally quickly lowered her own, prolonged the moment just a little, because this was so much fun, because it really was new. The guy laughed too, but not like he knew why. Okay, why are we laughing? It's like you said, Aunt Sally purred. Here we are, without even trying, without even planning to be here, just staring through a window, standing together in the cold. This isn't cold, not for Laramie. You're not from here, are you? Standing together where our kids can't see us, but we can see them, sharing a little, she could barely get the words out through her giggles, adult conversation. And with that, she couldn't hold on any longer. She lifted her face and let him see. He really was lonely, poor guy. A single dad, maybe. Nearly as starving as she was in his way. Because even that first slow-eyed, shadowy glimpse completely blew him out. Shut him down, like an old speaker with too much music cranked through it. There he stood, all locked up, even his beard erect. <laughs> Sorry, Aunt Sally said, and laughed even louder. She touched his face carefully. She thought he might explode like a firecracker she'd lit. I'm going to stop there. That scene ends with Jew finding them in the alley. Thank you. So, I, I think what was in keeping with, to the extent that I have a theme this morning, the theme of the morning, what was so surprising about those books to me was not, I mean, after the initial shock of, hey, I guess I do have an idea for a vampire story, but that when I wrote the first one, Motherless Child, that I was convinced, and this time I'm right, had the best ending on it that I will ever be lucky enough to somehow come up with. I'm really, you might not like the book, you'll like the ending. Uh, I'm really proud of that ending, and it is final. The idea that that story kept unfolding for me feels miraculous to me. That the two books that came after it, they're not sequels, really, to me. It's all one story. It's really, I wrote an 800-page novel that it took me three books to write. Um, and so that was just incredibly rewarding, and I think I am lucky that these books <coughs> came to me, that this particular idea fell out of the air into my lap when I was a pro, to the extent that I am, meaning when I knew how I worked, because I don't think I would have trusted it 20 years ago. I think I would have tried to shape it I didn't know where it was going after that ending. And it wound up in this place that is really, it's funny, um, the first book, that first vampire book, in some ways, I'm really proud of it, but it is more straight up horror than anything else I will ever write in a lot of ways. It is fast, bloody, intense, scary. The second book 
even more so, and yet something was starting to turn. This book, by this book, I come home. Like, this feels like the, the novel about me and to me. Like, me growing up in Detroit when I was 11. Like, I was back on home ground. And so this trilogy brought me all the way back to where I was. So much so that I finished it, and, you know, all happy people came out of that really irritating, overquoted and often misquoted line of Tolstoy. It's at the beginning of Anna Karenina, and you know it about how all happy families are alike, all sad families are sad in their own way. I don't know if you've ever heard that line. What a load of crap. Um, and one of the, and this has always been actually a challenge for me as a writer, is that my stuff does not sit. I would like to think when I write horror, I am scary, but that's not all I am. And when I write literature, or what people call literature, I'm still not afraid of story. I'm telling you a story. I want it to be action-packed. If there's danger in it, you're going to feel it. If there's suspense in it, I want to build it. Um, and so that has confused people. I know for the horror crowd, I'm just not miserable enough um, for some of them. They like what I do, and yet a lot of them will tell me, ah, you're sort of a horror. Um, wait till they get a load of all happy people. Um, but that book, I mean, I really do, I feel in so many ways so lucky with what I've gotten to do with my time in my life. Teaching, writing, talking about writing, and writing. I get up every day to write, and what I feel like is I'm doing the world's hardest crossword puzzle every single day. And on the very few days where I actually nail one and finish it, and make other people happy. What a great job. It really, it's, it uses all of you. Um, and so moving from something as dark and intense as this to something as wistful and playful as the stories I've been writing lately, and so of course now having sort of announced to myself that I'm done writing horror for a while, all of a sudden I seem to be writing a ghost story novel. <laughs> Um, that's the little miracle that writing has given me amongst many, but maybe my favorite one. And um, I don't know, how much time do I have? Do I, where's Dwight? How much time do you want me to use? Five minutes? Mm. Um, I mean, I can give you a taste of the, uh, the breezy stuff. I can talk about my weird publishing. What, is there anything you would particularly like to hear about and talk about teaching? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always a surprise to me how you can get pigeonholed into a genre by mistake. In this case, you are what you are now because of what you wrote. Can you get out of it? Can you go and do other types of genre? Do you yeah, cause, it? because that's not real. I know. I mean, well, that's the thing. I mean, the answer to your question is you don't get pigeonholed. I mean, first of all, meaning what? You have to remember this is just a reality thing. There's so little money. There's so little money. Um, the, I think the median sale price for a novel, not a first novel right now, we're talking major press, is about $5,000. Um, so you have to know that. So in a lot of ways, the only time pigeonholing becomes a problem is if it's not a problem anymore because everybody knows you. You know what I mean? And so, Yes, it's true that when I signed with my new agent, he was excited about this, but the challenge for him was, okay, you are, I am the very definition of a cult writer right now, meaning I have about 5,000 people out there who seem absolutely committed to reading whatever I write, and what a great thing. How lucky am I? I've gotten nine books out. I feel incredibly grateful and like I've had a career. Um, but that has been where my sales level has been for a really long time. And the reviews I've gotten, I've been lucky enough to get, suggest that it should be bigger. So his challenge is to give me the career I've always imagined for myself, which what I've always wanted to be, honestly, was I wanted to be Robert Louis Stevenson, meaning I wanted to be that guy who, whatever he wrote, you knew you were going to be told a story. 
You knew it was going to be fun to read. You knew you were going to get characters you remembered in places you wanted to be in, in situations you maybe never want to be in. Um, that you were going to be moved and made to feel something, and it didn't matter what he wrote. I mean, Robert Stevenson wrote incredible travel narratives. He wrote the best pirate story ever written. He wrote two or three of the greatest ghost stories ever written. He wrote historical narratives. He wrote straight up literature. He just wrote. That's what I've done, and I'm 52, 53 years old. <laughs> I had this really nice life. I have intermittently made money as a writer. I get my books out. I have a teaching job I love. I have a family I love. And I get to get up every day and go to work. I would love to get pigeonholed and, you know, to have that problem. But if this is my career, it's great. Um, I'm fine with that. So I'm not going to worry about that. Pigeonholing is one of those things, let your editor worry about it. Let marketing people worry about it. Don't worry about it. Write a good story and let the world figure it out. I really believe that. I do not know any writers who are good marketers. They are really separate skills. I am terrible at it. And so all I do is write it and kind of look for someone I think might be able to market and send it to them. So I don't know if that's exactly a helpful answer to you, but I wouldn't be afraid of that. Just write stories. If they're good, I really believe this. I really believe this. The market's terrible. It's always been terrible. And the thing is, if you're good, and you are stubborn, and you are resilient, and you're persistent, the good stuff gets out. They are looking for you. People want stories. That's the irony. There's less money than there's ever been, and there are more people reading. There's hunger for content out there. People are starving for it. So I would honestly tell you, just write it. Get it out there. It'll find its place. It looks like, okay, I'm going to leave it there, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> like he's president or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I have prattled quite enough. Um, I'm, I'm saying nothing unless there's something you actually want to know about. So, um, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Wikipedia is a little vague on your Sherman Jackson uh, so, the major, so the Shirley Jackson people, um, they have been very good to me because they were also, the, the, they were previously the International Horror Guild. And um, they, in, so I've won two International Horror Guilds for best collection. Um, those of you who bought the book, The Two Sams, that won that. Um, one for story, and then when the Shirley Jackson Awards, when the International Horror Guild contacted the Shirley Jackson Foundation, and they agreed to let her name be used, and in a wonderful way, that award expanded and became any fiction with a dark tone, and they take the writing very seriously, and so the first year I won for a, a novella, another 68-page story, uh, called The Janus Tree. So that, uh, that's the title story of a collection that's a little hard to get these days, except digitally. And now that I have the new agent, I'm hopeful that someone will do a collected and that will be more easily available. But that's what they were for. Thank you. Yeah? Um, after you finished Motherless Child, you thought you were done. Yeah. <laughs> for two years. Yeah. <clears throat> then at one point you realized that you did have two more books in you. Did, did you have a full vision for how that, that cycle of stories was going to play out? or? Thank God, no, because I really think I would have been bored. Yeah. Um, I'm a pretty restless writer. I am also a very linear thinker, so I usually know what I'm, I am not a poet. I love, I love imagery, you might have gotten that sense. Um, I, um, but I'm not a poet. I am laid out, where am I going? Those books, part of the ride was I know what happens five minutes later, I don't know where this road goes. Um, and what was really satisfying about hitting the end, so the book was called Motherless Child. I didn't have the motherless children idea. Like the idea, that title was vaguely in my head just because you know, the most clever sequel title there's ever been, not mine. Um, you know, Alien, and then, well, how do you top that? 
add an S. Very good. Um, but that was not what I was thinking with this. It just turned out that the whole series, in a way that I wasn't expecting, was about parenting, the experience of losing a parent, um, which is a club we all join if you're lucky enough to live long enough, um, coming to terms with our parents, all that kind of stuff. And so it was the meatiness of that, it was what was in there that held my attention the whole way. And as soon as I started realizing that every single character in the book, I mean, the lead vampires, what are they called? The Aunt Sally and Mother. Um, every character in the book is either a childless mother or a motherless child. Then I started to just relax and felt like, okay, I don't know where this is going, but it does. Um, and really, it was, as compared to one of the ones where I thought I knew where it was going, that Federal Writers Project book, which took me 13 fucking years. 13 years. To the point where, when I finally, and that one, I had mapped it out and kept hitting the same page, page 320, and realizing there's no way to get to my ending from where I am, and throwing it in the trash. Um, I saved a draft always, but the, I never, when I finally wrote the final draft, I didn't use any of the old drafts. But I do remember in 2007, I did, this didn't come to me in my sleep. I was lying awake thinking about it for some reason. I was in the middle of writing another one of the ghost story books, and suddenly sat up in bed, shook my wife, and said, I know how to fix the book of bunk. I know what's wrong. She looked at me, punched me, and went back to sleep. <laughs> But these books, which I didn't plan to write at all, and didn't let myself think out, <coughs> they just came. There's no right or wrong there, by the way. I don't believe all those 10 rules of writing, any advice I can give you, discount it. Except trust the story. That's the best advice I can give you. If, if it wants to go somewhere, let it. It probably knows more than you do. Yeah. That segues right into do your characters wake you up at night and write a story and you have to get up and go do it? Well, sleeping is hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't write at night ever anymore because that would kill sleep. And what I tend to do is when I can, this was really hard when my kids were young, um, was get up before they did and before I had to go teach. And I liked being in that sort of fugue state halfway between sleeping and waking and just pound through however much time I had and then go on with my day. Um, I've usually said that it's more like the characters rent out the apartment and I hear them chattering through the walls and I wish they would shut up and they throw parties sometimes and uh, some of them are better tenants than others. I've gotten better over the years at, and maybe just because I've been writing almost every day in some way. And I really want to stress, I tell my students this all the time, it sounds like I'm so militant and disciplined, and I guess I am. But part of the way I got that way was I don't torture myself, meaning if I've got 15 minutes in me that day, I do 15 minutes, and that's okay. But I write every day. And so my brain seems to know when I sit down, oh, we're writing, and I go right to it, and I wouldn't say it shuts up. they shut up after that, but they do their shopping and go about their day and chatter, and then they let me know when they've been up to when the time comes. So it's better than it used to be. Writing is not good for sleep, as you clearly know. Yes. So, yeah. Um, I really admire your discipline. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that, I, I'm not a disciplined person. I think it's more lunacy, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've also been writing my whole life. Good for you. And until I was about five years old, um, I used to tell whopper lies, just <laughs> terrible whopper lies. And I used to get in trouble for telling lies. Yeah. But I had such um, an imagination that um, it was- Occupational hazard. Yeah, it was hard for me to, actually tell the truth, the, yeah. just the boring truth. I was had to <laughs> embellish it. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to school and learned to write or print or whatever, um, 
all of a sudden it was acceptable, you know. Right. It was acceptable and I was writing stories. Yeah. So I've been doing this my whole life, but I do not have your discipline and I'm really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really, honestly, to me, it started as discipline and it became a pleasure. It be and or or and a necessity. It became like brushing my teeth. Honestly, it's just something at this point that I can't imagine the day without it. And so it doesn't feel like that in the same way anymore. The other thing I want to jump on about what you said isn't it ironic? And part of the hell that the of conflicting messages that the world gives you if you choose to write. That what do people want from fiction? Truth. <laughs> if you think about that, it's so problematic in so many ways. Um, and I do think the best trick fiction tells the truth. Slant, like Emily Dickinson said, you know, mm -hmm. sideways, the only way human beings can actually hear truth, I think. So, um, one, one so, thing she didn't say was that she, was, she writes comedy in a way that is truthful because it's based on what she knew as a child wow. growing up, and she puts it back in now as an older woman. That's fantastic. <laughs> Mark Twain, who said, all good humor comes from pain, there are no jokes in heaven. <laughs> yeah. so. Sorry about is that. that no, that's all right. Is that a question? <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, sorry. It's like my students, I can't. No, that, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. um, because you're, you have so much time in your hands, uh, <laughs> do you teach any uh, like short courses online? I do not do online. I do. I used to do adult conferences all the time because I really enjoy this. Um, I enjoy interacting with other people who are really trying to make this part of their lives in whatever way that they can. And if I can be helpful with that, that makes me feel useful. Um, I am very. Look, like I said, I don't believe in isms. What works for me isn't necessarily what works for you. I'm very skeptical about the teaching of creative writing online, only because so much of it is about seeing someone else's face, hearing their tone of voice, see, having them react, being able to talk. The workshops, the reason, you all know what I mean by workshop, right? You know, writers, the workshop format, the reason it has lasted so long is that nobody actually knows. It's an argument. And for the argument to be as supportive, specific, intense, and joyful as I think it should be, you've got to be in the room. So I've seen other people who do really effective work online. I infinitely prefer to do it in person. So, and I'm getting back into what? <laughs> I am getting very much back into, as my kids, I, my son's in college, and my daughter is a junior in high school, um, and I, my time is just a little bit coming back. And I find myself, one of the things I'm very much wanting to do and getting back into really fast is going back on that circuit a little bit. So if you have interest in my coming out sometime, we can work that out. I, I actually love that org, so. Do you have a website? I do. Um, it, my name .com. Um, and a uh, Facebook page too. I don't post there, but I will check messages there. So, what else can I tell you about? Or talk with you about? Or hear about? How did you go about getting an agent? <laughs> Stupidly. Um, so the first. What? You probably said, oh, I don't do it. Uh, no, I didn't. Well, I did. And that sort of worked out for me. It sort of didn't. I mean, the truth is, agents are in a tricky spot right now. Because it is possible to do it yourself. The contract templates, that is the thing you need the agent for, more than anything else. The one thing the agent I left for 13 years taught me is read the contract. Um, the two books over there, The Snowman's Children and The Two Sams, they were bought by Carolyn Graff, which was, at the time, the last major independent publisher in New York. And um, a year after I sold them those books, they got bought by 
the Dutch holding companies that own most of the publishing houses in New York. And they immediately closed down the fiction line. And every fiction writer but me, their books are still in print and they're still, I mean, still out of print and they are in court fighting to get their rights back. My agent crossed out the clause in the contract that said they own the rights. And then, so I own the rights. So those oh. books, I was able to resell those and keep those in print. She was worth the 13 years of torture of dealing with her just for that. So the way I got her, I don't, it, I've gotten my three agents all in the same way, and I wish I knew a quicker way, and that is, I looked at the writers I love, or who I feel like in some way, I see some continents between their work and my work. Found out who their agent was, you can find it online really easily, and I sent a letter. Um, I did this first in graduate school. I made a list from one to 30 of most desirable to least desirable. I really didn't deserve an agent at that point. I got the number two guy on my list, which was a disaster. Um, he, I stayed with him for four years, realized I wasn't hearing from him much, called him up to ask how my three books I'd sent him were doing, none of which you will ever read, thank God. So in a way, he did me a service. Um, and what he said to me was, oh yeah, Glenn, I look at you as my retirement plan. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I know, I know that sooner or later you are going to write something I can sell in one phone call for six figures. So I'm waiting for that book. Uh, <laughs> so I fired him. Um, and then I wrote, some, I was a few years older, wrote The Snowman's Children and knew weirdly when I wrote it, oh, that's going to be the one. That's the first one that's going to sell. There are four in the drawer. That's the one. I knew it. Um, did the same thing. She was the fourth or fifth one that I sent to. This time around, you know, one nice thing about being out there all this time is that I have something of a reputation. I've won some nice prizes. I've gotten some really nice feedback from other writers, which has been particularly gratifying. Um, and so this time, when I was making my list, I noticed that, okay, not only does this guy represent some people who I like, those people like me. Uh, and I wrote to one of them and said, hey, could you put in a good word? And not only did he, but then the agent called me and said, oh, I know who you are. You're looking for an agent? So that was easy? Although doing it is awful because I mean, the whole business, this is something you should keep in mind because you, you gotta overcome it. All of the writing industry is set up to make you feel small. And it's not true. They can't do it without you. They really can't. So this is why when you see these agency pages where they say things to you, when you submit like, due to the overwhelming number of submissions, we can't respond to each query that we get, but if we're interested, we'll be in touch. I mean, there's no solution for that with their, you're an agent, and they do receive a lot of queries. That said, oh my God, it's a computer program. How hard is it to write a template that says, thank you for showing us your work, good luck, it's not for our list. Yeah. Yeah. How hard is that? Yeah. But they don't. Um, so you have to brace yourself for that. And when you're submitting stories, here's, you want an actual piece of advice that I do believe in? And it's hard, because it cuts out about half the market. Do not ever, Submit to a magazine that charges you a reading fee. That's ridiculous. You have already put in your risk and your chance. You wrote the story. If the magazine isn't good enough at picking stories that attract enough readers for them to stay in print, they're not a good magazine. They're, that's right. And they will give you all this rationale about if writers want there to be markets, you should support magazines like ours. Baloney. There are no magazines without your work. You are doing them a favor, giving them the honor of considering your story. No joke. I am not laughing about that. And it's half the industry now. It's half the magazines that are out there. And some of, not all, but some of the really big ones. And by the way, I'm not talking about if someone says $3 for online submission manager, pay them that. That's real. But if they say subscribe to the magazine 
or $25 and they'll give you feedback, meaning their graduate student first reader will, read you, will give you feedback, don't do that. Have some pride in your work because you deserve it. Yeah. Um, I recently um, subscribed to um, Poets and Writers yep. magazine. Yep. And I was so disappointed yep. because that's yep. all it is. Yes. And it has all these expensive um, events that you go to and you. So Poets and Writers does one good thing and it's free. It's on their webpage. And they have a massive database of literary magazines and contests and agents. It is unwieldy. You have to spend a lot of time going through it. This is something I do every year, though. I make myself do in January every year just so I know what the market is and what I might be looking for. Mm -hmm. That's very valuable. I found the magazine the same as you, that it's just a lot of people mm -hmm. shilling yeah. and looking to make money off of people like you without honoring your craft or your work. Right. And I don't believe in that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, yes. I found that out 30 years ago. Um, how do you um, market your books? What do you find? Do you have any best ways that you do that? And what works best? Uh, Get somebody else to do it. I mean, like I said, I really, I don't know any writers who are, who are really good marketers. That said, so I'll tell you what I think doesn't work, and then I'll tell you what I think has been most useful for me, which is all I can say. I do not believe in the web. Uh, as most people who are reading a lot of books are spending less time online, it's just true. Hor I, um, when The Two Sams, my second book came out, um, the publisher and I agreed to split it, because that's how that works. Um, and we bought a web PR guy for a month. And he did get that book all over the web, meaning on every blog, remotely related to ghost stories or literary ghost stories or anything like that. It was all over the web. First thing that came up on, it wasn't Google, I don't remember what the search engine was then, but it was everywhere. I don't think sales increased five books from that. Because what you quickly figured out is everyone on those blogs, it's the same people, number one, it's the same 200 people going to every one of those blogs. And number two, by that point, the ones who knew who were going to buy my book, they already knew me. They already had it. So I don't believe in that. Facebook, you're, oh God, it's actually, it's hard for me to even read. A lot of, there are a lot of very good horror writers out there. But they are, a lot of them are on Facebook talking about the golden age of horror and the renaissance of horror. And every now and then, I just want to say to them, guys, you know you're just talking to each other, right? There's nobody reading that. Nobody believing that. So I don't believe in that. I don't believe in tweeting every second and all that kind of stuff. I do believe in this. I, and it depends on what you're good at. Some people are willing to sit there after they write and blog all day and respond all day. You know what, if that's your thing, do it. I don't judge that. I only know one or two people who have the stamina for that. Um, and the, it's a different kind of relating. I like doing this. I like getting out and reading and hearing other writers talk about what they do and what they're struggling with and talking about that and feeling like usually when I interact with people and I don't even have to be talking about my books, we're talking about writing, that seems to get people interested. And really, writing is an act of communication. That's what it is. You can write for yourself, but if you're going to be a writer, the only threshold for me, what does it make a writer? That you're showing your work to other people. That's the only real threshold to me. And so whatever gets you out there and your work out there in front of people, do that. Audio <coughs> definitely works. One thing, like, if you can get your stuff recorded for Audible, a lot, there's, people are spending so much of their lives in the car right now. People, audio, audio books are selling, ebooks have flatlined, audio books are selling like crazy. It's the only growth area of the industry. So, there are podcasts now where people, especially a lot of self-published authors, are experimenting with doing sort of serial podcasts where they're reading their books a chapter at a time and posting them on sites. I think Smashwords has a, collect, a connection where you can do that. Do that. Anything that gets your work in front of people, gets your voice in front of people. So that's probably, I wish I could say, well, this is how you get to 10,000 sales. 
If there's a formula, I don't know it. I've hit it once or twice, but for the, like for things I would never have expected to be the things. Yeah. Manual. It's in the, it's in the oh, it's a ma it's a magazine called Poets and Writers. It, I think it's pw.org, and they have go on the databases, and they have a huge list of literary magazines, contests, and agents and small press publishers. Now, do you have, do you have any opinion on what would be best for someone that is uh, writing content literature? Yeah, define that for me. Uh, how how to. Mm -hmm. and she's writing books on how to do a watercolor painting. Yeah. I'm a children's writer, storybook writer, and I do uh, the, the preschool level books. Yeah. So I don't know those publishers off the top of my head. What I will tell you is there's a market for that for sure because there. I mean, one of the there are many things I don't like about the web. One of the things I love about the web is that it has empowered and emboldened a lot of people to make more art. And I always believe that people making art is people not doing a whole lot of other stupid things they shouldn't be doing. Um, and so there are a lot of people who are really wanting to pursue this, who, who are getting good at this, and who are looking constantly for advice. And there is where I would say, I'm going to contradict the advice I just gave, there is where I would say getting online, getting a blog, and starting, you know, throwing a tip out there, telling an anecdote about someone, how someone used this, maybe when you get a few visitors running a little contest and asking people to submit things they've done with it, that can really establish you as someone with credibility on this. And then there are absolutely always publishers looking for this. They may not be huge, but though that market is there. That'll be on Poets and Writers, for sure. So. I saw a hand back here, I thought. Right. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Was it? Did I? This? No? OK. Yeah. How would you compare the poets and writers list versus something like writer's market that's published annually? Is that? Well, <laughs> there, there are advantages to both. Okay. Um, writer's market, that's actually what I use because I like books. I will spend a lot longer with the print uh, then I will, you know, when I go through it every January, which is torture, um, but I will actually read the damn book, whereas on the line, I just so quickly start to zone out and I hate scrolling through it. Um, Poets and Writers has the advantage of it's all hyperlinked, and so if you find a magazine that you're interested in, you can immediately click on it. It will take you directly to the submissions page, and you can see really fast, okay, they're open on May 1st, Okay, they're looking for this, this is the length. So I use both. I use Writers and Market to make my list, and then when I've got something that's ready to send out, I go check it against the Poets and Writers list. I don't browse the Poets and Writers list because life is too short. But I don't like writing that much. Um, but you may find, but people who, spend the, who are comfortable doing that online, that's the fastest for sure. Anything else? Yes, sir. No, so, I mean, uh, the San Bernardino chapter of my life still makes me sad in that I loved that job. I left, so I was teaching at an independent high school um, called Campbell Hall in Studio City. They have been great to me. And one of the things they did was some, they figured out pretty early, I don't know what he's talking about, but he seems to be, the students seem to like it. Let that guy run, see what he does. And I you know, started as an English teacher and then pretty quickly this creative writing program I run just took over my job. I left it to come out to San Bernardino. I was out there three years to launch that, help launch that program. I loved it. I, you know, With a writer's unerring financial instincts, I went to work for the state of California in the fall of 2008. No. Um, and pretty quickly realized, okay, first of all, Either I can stay teaching college, or my kids can go to college, but probably not both. Um, and secondly, honestly, I mean, I love my experience at CSUSB. There are so many good people there. The system, because it's so starved, it's such a mess. 
Um, and I knew a month after I got there, the program does not have the resources. They're not behind it. They are not, they are, they are absolutely at a stalemate in terms of they have so little money that the fighting over it is just vicious. Um, and so, you know, I was in my tenure year. That wasn't, I mean, I, no arrogance. I'm just saying I, I had a lot of books out. I was well respected as a teacher. I was going to get tenure. And I just looked at it and thought, it's like tying myself to a sinking ship. And so then I was looking at both college and high school because one of the things I learned when I was at San Bernardino was I like teaching writing. I like working with writers. I don't actually care about the level, which is why I enjoy working with, such, with really diverse groups like this, where there are so many people doing so many different things and at so many different levels. It's all talking about writing. It's all the same stuff. So I looked at university, I looked at high schools, and one of the things that happened is my old school I, really surprised me, called me and said, come back and run your program, come back and run your program. This thing you set up, I set up this thing, I was telling Jerry about it. Um, one of the things, probably the thing I'm proudest of in my teaching life is this thing I did at CSUSB. How do you, how's a writer make a living? Well, one way is teaching. So I set up this program called Crew, where I was teaching my graduate students how to teach the first semester of an introductory creative writing course properly, and then sending them out to the high schools in San Bernardino, which are some of the most micromanaged, test-driven schools in the country, to teach creative writing. And um, that was unbelievably rewarding. And so my school said, come back and bring that back. And again, I thought, hey, it's not gonna work with high school kids. Mm -hmm but it does. And my most passionate kids now, I teach them all year how to teach the first six weeks of the creative writing course I give them, which is the creative writing course I wished I'd had in high school or college either for that matter. I didn't really get this till graduate school. And then I send them out to the poorest schools in LA to teach creative writing to fifth grade. Teaching now. And I do as much of this as I can. I still go and talk to graduate programs and all that kind of stuff. I don't know that I'll do the high school for the rest of my life. High school is, I love working with adolescents. High school itself is a grind. High schools are the problem, not high school kids. Um, it's just any good teacher will tell you that fighting through what you have to fight through to get actually meaningful content in front of students, as soon as you do it, the students eat it up. It's not hard reaching kids, it's hard getting through the thicket yeah. with enough of you intact to reach the kids. Um, so that gets tiring, and I'm not going to say that the day won't come where I decide, mm, I'm going to go back to an easier way of teaching, but it's awfully fulfilling. And honestly, if my, I mean, like, I've had years where I've made a living off of my writing, but if that were to happen in a way that I could sustain right now, I don't think I would leave teaching anyway. I might teach a little less, but it's been so good for my writing and vice versa. Endless supply of characters. You're short on characters? Teach adolescents for a year. <laughs> Anything else? Probably have time. Yeah? Are you frustrated by the lack of grammatical knowledge these days? Do you find fifth graders don't know what a period is, or that the adults don't know what a period is? I've seen that so much, and I don't know how you fix that while you're also just trying to help some of So I may surprise you or disappoint some of the teachers in the room by saying, nah. And I'll tell you why. When people love, fall in love with writing, when they want to write, it's amazing how fast they pick up the grammar and how easy it is to say, okay, so you know this thing you're doing with the commas that actually doesn't make sense and people don't know what you're talking about. But if you have them doing a million exercises with Jane walked the dog and went home, that isn't going to make anybody a writer. I would argue that isn't even going to make anybody. There's a really big difference between being a competent writer and a good writer. Um, and so grammar, it's, I tell my students all the time, grammar is not less important, important in creative writing, it's more. Meaning, people have to know what you're saying. So it's not that I don't teach it, it's that to me, and again, this is only for me. This is what's worked for me. 
I teach grammar really intensively as part of the stories they are really excited about writing. I don't start with a bunch of grammar lessons first. So that's, that's what's worked for me. That, I'm not saying it's the only way. <laughs>